Hi, this is Chris, the Guitar Amp Tech from Sydney, Australia. Today we're going to be looking at a Vox Corgira AC30 TB, TBX um, amps. This one's blowing fuses as soon as you go from standby to play mode. If that sounds like something you might be interested in, go grab yourself a coffee, pull up a chair and let's get started. Even if you don't have one, you'll probably pick up some techniques that you can apply to your amp. Now before we get started, let me give you a little bit of background to Vox. Unlike the boom time in the USA, post-World War II, Britain was going through a bit of a tough time. One way to bolster the economy was to put a ban on American-made musical instruments. Now this eventually made a gap in the market for companies like Vox and Marshall. A young 27-year-old Tom Jennings started repairing accordions and selling used instruments in towards the end of the war, around 1944. He knew Dick Denny from the war years. They worked together, I think. Jennings hired the guitarist as an engineer, and in 1957, Dick Denny designed the circuitry um, for the first amp to bear the Vox name in 1958 the AC-15. And so the JMI era had started. The Shadows um, had a great guitarist called Hank Marvin, who I'm sure you know, wielded a, a beautiful Fiesta Red um, Stratocaster. And they were early adopters of Vox as well. And Hank needed a louder and brighter amp. So the 30 watt AC-30 came out in 1959 known as the AC30-4. Challenge for you, if you know the difference between the AC34 and the AC30-6, put it in the comments below. I can think of two differences, if I haven't got it wrong, two. Let's see what you can come up with. Um, Let's see, what else can I tell you? Oh yeah, Hank needed more sound, more top end sound rather, for his clean and trebly uh, Strat. And this led to the treble channel coming out in the AC30. Uh, then in 18, uh, 1962, probably the most famous Vox of all, the AC30 slash six top burst was released. It wasn't just the Shadows who uh, adopted the Vox for that British sound. It was the Kinks, it was the Rolling Stones, others that I can't think of, oh, except for one, a little band called The Beatles. In 1964, Tom Jennings developed a relationship with a company in California called the Thomas Organ Company. And this was importing, uh, they were importing, sorry, Vox amps uh, into the USA. And... Um, they eventually started manufacturing uh, Vox amps with British sounding names like the Cambridge, the Viscount and Buckingham. Problem was, um, players did not want the new transistors, which the Thomas Organ Company was building Vox amps with. Guitarists wanted valves, and they still do. By this time, uh, Jennings and Denny had left Vox and the ownership had passed through many hands as the company was stumbling along. Uh, Dallas Arbiter bought them in the early 70s. Korg acquired the majority uh, stake in Rose Morris in 1992. And this brings us to the TB and TBX era of this amp. These amps revisited the original JMI design. Great. And unfortunately opted for circuit board construction. And making a good PCB amp requires a whole new set of skills, some of which Korg nailed and some they missed. And so we arrive at this amp. We may end up exploring some of these issues, but first we have to get it working. As soon as you turn it on, bang, it blows um, the HT fuse as soon as we go from standby to play mode. In an upcoming video, we'll be working on a JMI era Vox. So please make sure you subscribe and press the bell icon. 
In all honesty, I earn my daily bread through amp repairs. And I'm booked solid. So unfortunately, videos don't get made as often as I would enjoy. And I do enjoy making these. So please press the bell icon and uh, then YouTube will notify you when I've uploaded that next video. Let's get started on this. Okay, I've pulled the chassis out and we can see these two little gems here. We have got here some British Celestian greenback speakers made in Britain. So how can you tell that they're made in England? Well, this is my technique. I read made in England. So here we have the inside of the um, AC30 TBX version. I like the chassis mounted EL84 sockets, chassis mounted rectifier. Um, they have the um, preamp tubes, uh, circuit board mounted, which is not the best. 100 ohm, 100 ohm, 100 ohm, 100 ohm. These are the screen grid resistors. Um, I think we now know that 100 ohm is just too low a value and um, I will probably replace these with either 470 uh, or 1k and that'll just make their life a little bit easier. I did test all of the tubes. Um, one of them flunked out and they look pretty old. I wouldn't be surprised if they were the original tubes. They're just so far out that I'll have to break the news to the owner that he'll need to get three or four new tubes. I tested the, um, the GZ34. It's fine. Oh, I also tested all of the preamp tubes. They're all 12A X7s except for one fella in the vibrato circuit so here's our vibrato circuit this is a ECC 83 12 AX7 this one is the only non 12 AX7 in the whole amp and it's an ECC 82 which is the same as a 12 AU7 and it failed its test as well so all the other 12 AX7s I haven't tested anything for Mycroft and I haven't been able to power it up yet because it keeps blowing fuses. So there, there might be more problems, but so far, electrically tested, um, all the 12A7s are okay. So yeah, I wouldn't mind replacing these with a higher value and then mounting them off the circuit board because if these things get too hot, we don't want it to damage that track underneath there. So we'll just elevate them and increase that value a bit. So if it's not the rectifier tube, which was my first suspicion, if it's not that, then it could be our first two filter capacitors. So with that fuse out, we should be able to test from fuse to ground. And that will effectively be measuring that capacitor there. And my ESR meter is reading 44 microfarad, 2.2 ohms. 44, yep, that's near enough. So this is one thing which they could have done a little bit better. Um, these are your filament windings. Yeah, you see they're marked H, I think, on the little thing there. Your heaters, filament, same thing. And they're supposed to be twisted. Um, you know, the, the textbook amount of twists is um, a minimum of three twists per inch. So if that looks like about three inches of wire, two inches of wire, you'd be expecting at least six twists in there. And there's one. So that hasn't got sufficient twists to do full hum rejection. 100 and 100, yeah, they're parallel. They're our cathode resistors that sets up the bias. Oh. Hello, we think I have found the problem. One of those cathode resistors has snapped off at its base. 
and it was laying across here. I didn't take note of where it was, but if it was touching there, that would be the screen, that would definitely blow fuses. All right, we've released the circuit board. Flip him up gently and have a look. Okay, so here's the earth wire. Now this is probably going to be, just double check, yeah. And this will be connected to the pots, yep. Right, so here's that other green wire, which comes around and connects to the earth as well. And that is coming in where? That's it right there. Right, so we've got this earth wire. I think we're going to have to disconnect this connection between here and here. Or else we're going to set up a bit of an earth loop. So we're going to cut the track, I think right about there. Not sure if you can see that. We're going to cut the track there and that'll eliminate that one ground loop. I've done a couple of things. I, unfortunately I couldn't get as many twists as I wanted to um, with the filament wiring. In this case I'm thinking that's going to be a sufficient improvement. We're going to eliminate that hum from the filament wiring. The other work I did is I replaced all of those screen grid resistors and so I am now modifying the amp away from the original design, but to be closer to the spirit of the original um, JMI AC30. The harsh reality is even now today's production tubes are really good, damn good. I'm happy to use them. They're not as good as the old British and um, American tubes or the Dutch tubes. Truth is, if we're running 100 ohm screen grids, the screen's just going to be running too hot. So we need to drop them down a bit. Um, you can go to 470. I decided to go to 1K. I'm going to have to replace all the four of the power tubes. I've discussed that with the customer. He's happy to proceed with that. So I want them to last as long as I can. So by introducing a higher um, value of screen grid resistor, it's going to drop uh, lower that screen voltage a little bit, which will now cool down that tube a little bit. If you're not sure on why that is so, take it to the extreme. Let's say that these are now infinitely large. In other words, the screen has disconnected. The tube will turn off. This is going to make the tubes run a little bit cooler. And um, as a bit of a belt and braces thing, I've also elevated them off the board, you know, by, I don't know, what's that, quarter of an inch, half centimetre, something like that. Similar air gap underneath these new higher power cathode resistors for our EL84s. Instead of doing the two 100 ohm in parallel, would get us to the period correct 50 ohm of the JMIs, but... Once again, to protect these tubes, they don't need to run at 115, 120%. Class A at 100% is just perfect in my book. So by doing two 150s in parallel, we're down at 75 ohms. And that's going to also help those power tubes run a bit cooler in line with, with that. The schematic shows a 47 microfarad capacitor in that first reservoir capacitor position. So why aren't I going to use this 47 microfarad capacitor in that first reservoir position? Answer? Ah, uh, because you don't like black capacitors? Oh, Mr. Smartass, you're back. Don't take me for a fool, Mr. Smartass. Some of my favourite capacitors are black, like the F&Ts. No, that's not the reason. That first reservoir capacitor 
is 47 microfarad. Then we have the choke, and then we have another capacitor of 22 microfarad. That's a hell of a lot of capacitance. The original AC30s would have had two 16s, one before the choke, one after the choke. Now, personally, I don't think 16 is enough um, filtration for your first reservoir cap. It's opening the door for potential harm. But 47 is definitely way too much. I tend to like over filtering more than under filtering, but even I'm going to say, nah. The owner definitely wants to have a NAMP that's going to sound as close as possible to a JMI. So I'm certainly not going to put in a 47 because it's going to sound way too stiff, even for, for my tastes. So I'm going to put in maybe a 33 for that first one. Still much higher. It's still double what an original JMI is. I might go 22. And the second one will be a 22 as well. Then um, the other caps further down the line in this are 10s, 10s, more of that JMI era, which I think were like 8s. So um, unfortunately, I don't have all of those in 450 radial configuration. Um, like radial being like that, two on the same side, both pins on the same side, whereas Axial has got one pin going out that way, one pin going out that way, more like you'd find on a vintage amp. So I've had to order them in. So sadly, being in Australia, it means it'll take six months. Nah, kidding. But it'll take probably a week or two for them to get here. Generally, they come from the UK, um, sometimes Singapore. So I'll see you again in a couple of weeks' time. Meanwhile, I better write myself some notes because with a memory once diagnosed as being as good as a fish, um, I won't remember what I'm up to in two weeks' time. So catch you soon.